My name is uh, Margo Myman, and I'm co-chair of policy action of the Bay Area Chapter of Climate Reality Project. And on behalf of the chapter, I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's, this evening's event, Home Electric Electrification Incentives and Contractors. Um, and as you know, yeah. as climate impacts mount, we are all becoming more conscious of how we can use our personal choices to make a difference. And given the admissions intensity of the built environment, um, one of the most impactful things we can do to, is to electrify our homes. So we're pleased to be shining the light on the path to home electrification this evening. And we really thank you for joining us. Um, we've got some business to take care of before we uh, get started on the program. Climate Reality Project National Team has launched a campaign that's called Electrify Your Life. Um, and what you do with this campaign is take a pledge to go electric. And if you take that pledge, you'll receive periodic updates with resources and advice on how to make that happen. Uh, just so you know, Climate Reality Project is working closely now with Rewiring America. There are a lot of resources um, out there now. And um, at the national level, Re Rewiring America is a, is a great, great resources resource. Um, also, just to let you know that this event is being recorded and it's going to be available on the Climate Reality Sorry, Area yeah. YouTube channel too. within the next week or so. Uh, per custom, we're going to open our evening with a land acknowledgement. So I'd like to hand it over to Kate Carlson, who is a very active member of our Alameda Policy Squad. When we talk about land, we talk about land as part of who we are. It's a mixture of our blood, our past, our current, and our future. We carry our ancestors in us, and they're around us, as we all do. This is written by Mary Lyons from the Leak Land Band of the Ojibwe. Hello, I am Kate Kelson. I have called Alameda my home for over 30 years on the unceded land of the, the Miwika Ohlone tribe. The Miwika tribe is a tribe of Ohlone Indians indigenous to the present day San Francisco Bay Area, but they haven't always been recognized. Between 1776, 1849 missionaries and the Catholic Church um, and military supported Hispanic empire brought many distantly related and in some cases already um, intermarried tribal groups together at the missions and they lost their land. Their land was taken from them. In 1925, an assessment was made that the native Californians were extinct for all practical purposes. This caused the federal government to take the first steps to Miwaka land and they lost their land and they were den denied federal recognition. After many years of effort, they regained recognition and some land. In the early part of the 20th century, the Department of Interior recognized the Miwok tribe as the Indian tribe under the jurisdiction of the United States, but it is still ongoing. This is my call to action for the folks here today. I asked the local, I asked the local indigenous friend of mine, an elder, what we could do to help. They suggested that they needed help with clean water and stable electric infrastructure. I also invite you to attend the monthly indigenous voice readings and listening circle offered by the Climate um, Reality Bay Area chapter. And I encourage you to explore Indigenous-led grassroots change movements and campaigns. Thank you for your participation. Thank you very much, Kate. One more piece of business. I want to give everybody just a reminder of what uh, the group is all about here. Um, so I want to quickly share a little bit about our parent organization, the Climate Reality Project. Um, it's an international nonprofit organization founded and chaired by former U.S. Vice President and Nobel Laureate Al Gore. Uh, Mr. Gore founded the organization in 2006, shortly after the release of his award-winning documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. The organization's mission is to mobilize a global grassroots network of climate advocates. And today the climate reality spans 170 countries, now with 50,000 climate reality leaders around the world, trained by Mr. Gore about the climate crisis and its solutions. And as a matter of fact, there's a training happening this coming weekend in Korea. And one of our very active members, Alma Beck, is there right now in Korea to attend that training. So that's very exciting. Um, right here in the Bay Area, our chapter is one of over 100 nationwide chapters focused 
focused on taking urgent action to address the climate uh, crisis and the justice crises happening at the local level. We have over 1,600 members across the greater San Francisco Bay Area region, uh, making ours one of the largest chapters in the world. Um, we regular ho reg regularly host events like this one, as well as workshops and advocacy opportunities. And we welcome you to join us if you're not already a member and follow us on social media. So our events uh, team co-chair Sue is um, running our Zoom this evening, and she'll be sharing sharing a link to the chapter website in the chat where you can find more information about our, our work and a link to join. Um, and of course, you can find us easily by Googling Climate Reality Bay Area. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Kate Carlson, and uh, she's going to introduce our program and our speaker. Thank you for being here. As you may already know, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure will enable the nation to achieve up to 81% clean electricity by 2030 because they contain attractive incentives to electrify our lives. I know you're interested because you're here, but I just read this morning that seven in 10 Americans haven't heard, have heard little or nothing about climate law from a poll conducted by the Washington Post University of Maryland. We have a clear call to action here it's time to get the word out and get people excited. Um, that is why I'm so pleased that our guest speaker, Cooper Marcus of Quick Carbon, agreed to talk with us today. His business model connects all of the dots for the consumers and contractors, making this transition to electric homes simpler. So I knew Cooper, with all of his ex expertise in the home electrification process, would be an ideal quest to help us simplify how we talk to our family and our friends and to make sure our own home electrification choices are good ones. Cooper believes rightly that our move away from fossil fuels prevents the opportunity to respond to the climate crisis while also improving the quality of our lives. He has led high impact projects and products at high growth startups and large enterprises. And he recently spent two and a half years with PG&E focusing on wildfire risk reduction models. Cooper holds a BA in environmental studies with a focus in urban planning from UC Santa Cruz. Also, Quick Carbon recently won a prize from the US Department of Energy for equitable and affordable solutions to electrification for creating a model that is effective at providing electrification that is more affordable with them and if they weren't in, if they weren't involved sorry about that cooper with cooper's help this let's unclutter the monkey chatter from information overload and break down the barriers of change everyone please welcome our guest speaker chief quitter cooper marcus Wow, that was a lovely intro. Thank you, Kate. Very kind of you. Uh, all righty. Uh, let me get my screen share turned on. Um, yep, I think you can see it. So um, I'm going to maybe go a little bit off the script. Uh, <laughs> when I realized I had this chance to speak with this amazing group of climate activists, um, I thought, you know, I think a way and in talking with Kate and others that we can make this uh, time together even more valuable is by giving you uh, things we've learned at Quick Carbon uh, through helping folks electrify through our interactions with many climate groups, advocacy groups, policy groups, and of course, contractors, manufacturers, incentive programs, and others uh, that will equip and empower you as climate activists to accelerate residential electrification. So let's see, there we go. So let's dig in. Um, we're gonna talk about why we're here. I'm gonna introduce Quick Carbon. Gonna spend much of the time talking about how to pitch and promote and support electrification and then remind all of us how to take action. But first, happy birthday to you. Did you know it's today? <laughs> the IRA is one years old. Um, wow, what great fortuitous timing of this event uh, that we could have a birthday cake for the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, I did try to find uh, a picture of a birthday cake that's a, a bill, like a law, but in the form of a cake. That is not apparently a thing. Uh, but a cake with a windmill is pretty darn close. Happy birthday, Inflation Reduction Act. So why are we here? 
We're going to learn how and why to motivate residential electrification retrofits as powerful climate action, right? There's lots of reasons for electrifying your home, your neighbor's home, your friend's home, all of our homes. Uh, and one of the most important is because it has this multiplicative effect uh, of producing more and more climate benefit, uh, And I'm going to try to explain why and show you how. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you'll come away from this feeling more equipped to take action yourself, to help others around you take action, and perhaps most importantly, to know why you should be doing so, uh, to understand the, the state and the future of electrification and why it's so vitally important. So electrification. Too many syllables. Uh, what's it mean again? <laughs> okay, mostly it means heat pumps for space conditioning. We refer to that as HVAC or heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, heating and cooling. And then also heat pumps for water heating. We refer to those sometimes as HPWH or heat pump water heaters. Now it also includes induction stoves because indoor air quality uh, is really important. And also they can be a very a powerful entry point into a given home electrifying because, you know, most folks don't, I don't know, ever see their water heater, but they see and touch their stove nearly every day. Uh, also, EV chargers. Um, I'm mostly not covering transportation electrification, but there is indeed huge climate impact from moving from gas to electric vehicles. Uh, and a little bit, it means solar and battery and insulation, uh, but you'll see in a moment why mostly what we're talking about today is heat pumps for space conditioning and water heating and induction stoves. But what it really means when we really get down to it, those are all the things, but the action of electrification and the result we seek is we want homeowners buying from contractors. Now, I know it can feel a little uncomfortable getting mercenary, uh, but let's go there uh, because our climate requires it. Uh, we have an incredible opportunity to use our dollars as a form of climate action by buying things, buying from local small businesses, buying electrification retrofits, causing electrification to happen and accelerating progress on electrification for ourselves and everybody around us. So what do we want and when do we want it? <laughs> we want many more electrification retrofits. We want them done better and we want them purchased sooner. All right, how about quick carbon? What about us? What do we do? How's it work? Um, we do things for homeowners and also for contractors. Our service to homeowners is free and it more or less works like this. First, we develop a plan in which we're gonna right size all of the electrification measures or actions or retrofits in the home, including HVAC, heat pump, water heater, also EV charger, induction stove, dryer, insulation, solar, and there might be more like pool and spa heaters or other things. We're always going to work hard to right-size all the electrical work and try to minimize the necessity for service upgrades, panel upgrades. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And we're going to maximize all the rebates and incentives. We're going to, most importantly, perhaps, then coach and motivate. Having a plan by itself is not enough. Having somebody on your side that makes you feel like you're doing the right thing is so vitally important. Now, when our homeowner clients are ready, we match them up with contractors in our network and we make sure that the bids that come back have the optimal scope and are benchmarked to local standards so that homeowners feel comfortable with their purchases. We're gonna again check to make sure that rebates and incentives are maximized and we're gonna repeat because steps one through five get us to one thing being electrified, maybe your water heat, but then you need your space heater and your EV charger and your stove. So we'll go through this cycle a few times until party. Uh, here's what uh, a AI image generator came up with when I asked it for a photorealistic pinata in the shape of a gray rectangular residential natural gas meter hanging from a tree. I think the real pinata is going to look a lot better than this one, but hey, pretty good computer for coming up with that on the fly. Nicely done. So a little more clarity on what we do. 
Over on the left, you'll see that we do homeowner onboarding. There's a little survey. We collect some photos. We need access to utility data. And we have a video call like this with everybody we work with because expecting folks to electrify their homes without a conversation, without a coach, without a personal connection is for most folks just a bridge too far. People are not ready to click and buy heat pumps. They want to feel like they're supported in the journey. So we make sure we talk with everybody we work with. We make a plan. Then when our clients are ready, we refer them to the contractor. The contractor offers a bid. We are not contractors. We are helpers, coaches, advisors. The other day we were called uh, decarbonization doulas. I think that's generous. But <laughs> then the project happens. The contractor does the work. We help with the rebate processing. And we're constantly re-optimizing the plans, nurturing and educating homeowners, repeating this cycle across the different projects, which could take years until eventually we get to that fully electrified home and we get to hit the gas meter pinata. Now, we also do stuff for contractors. In our current business model, contractors pay us. We earn most of our revenue from contractors. And they like to work with us because we solve a lot of problems for them too. We spent two years in research and development before we helped our very first homeowner because we needed to find a way to accelerate residential electrification that didn't depend on government grants, that wasn't resting on a foundation of a ton of volunteer labor, that really motivated everybody in the right directions. When people ask what's in it for me, we needed to have really good answers, whether it was contractors, homeowners, incentive programs, and we made sure we did with the model that we're showing you here. This is the model that you just heard was awarded a prize by the US Department of Energy in a prize program where many other organizations, kind of like ours, but different, also applied and did not win because our model was picked to be the single most effective in terms of motivating and accelerating affordable and equitable electrification. So we partner with local contractors who we vet. These are often electrification curious. They're not really experts yet. We help them win more electrification projects, more bids. They're going to spend less time on paperwork. They're going to avoid costly and wasteful time making bids that go nowhere. Those are all things that impact the workforce. You've probably heard concerns about there's not enough workers to do all this electrification. Well, there certainly won't be if they're spending all of their time driving around trying to make proposals that don't get accepted. That consumes contractor workforce time. We like to help them spend most of their time turning wrenches. If we're gonna close this workforce gap, we need contractors to become more efficient. We also help solve the trust gap. You know, For decades now, there've been issues where homeowners don't really trust contractors. I don't really know why, lots of reasons really, but a great way to help address that is to bring in a third party. That's us. Uh, who can provide that, that coaching, that analysis, that confidence to the homeowner to proceed, but also can provide advice to contractors where we're coaching and advising them to move from being curious to electrification-centric to someday, someday maybe electrification only. We want them to see that the future of their business, the future is electrified. And in that regard, we become a local economic development program because contractors who do more and more electrification with us, seeing how much more efficient it is for them, will have the confidence to hire more staff and grow that local economic impact of electrification retrofits. Now, I mentioned we make money from contractors. We are unapologetically a for-profit business. Look, businesses can and must do good. Uh, I've been involved with lots of different startups, including nonprofits. I started a nonprofit co-op textbook store when I was an undergrad at UC Santa Cruz, because in that time, in that place, nonprofit and co-op was the optimal business model to achieve the outcomes we were seeking. Today, here, now, being a for-profit business is what we need. We found little evidence that we can scale residential weatherization or electrification with only nonprofit or government involvement. We need the power of business and profit seeking to help accelerate this. And we believe that building a business that's a scale fastest 
and have the largest impact. Now, of course, many others in this space are also for profit. The people that make the machines, the people that sell the machines to contractors, the contractors themselves, even utilities, they're all profit-seeking entities. I have a link on here and I'll be sharing the link to this presentation at the end. You could click through and learn more about how we uh, collaborate with community groups because we really are in partnership uh, with all of our different um, stakeholders, homeowners, contractors, community groups, nonprofit organizations, utilities, and others. We're getting recognized for our unique approach. Uh, you heard about this prize at the Equitable and Affordable Solutions to Home Electrification uh, program. Uh, and uh, now we're going for a bigger phase two prize in, in that program. Uh, we were selected for the Net Zero Accelerator at the U.S. Green Building Council, uh, the only accelerator, at least that we know of, that focuses on helping organizations that are decarbonizing the built environment. And this is helping also expand our reach in Southern California. We were selected by another DOE program at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And I was recently invited to join the implementation working group at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, where I'm helping them figure out how to implement on time, because I want it to happen on time, the nation's first ban on the sale of gas water heaters and furnaces. We're also having some success. We're working with over a thousand homes, mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area, but we recently expanded to serve all of California. We've made over 400 connections between homeowners and contractors, and over 125 times has that resulted in electrification retrofits occurring. Now, mostly those are HVAC and heat pump water heaters and quite a bit of electrical work either related to those uh, projects or for EV chargers, induction stoves, or electric dryers. We also end up doing a little bit of solar insulation, pool and spa heat pumps, um, we had a client with a, an electric kiln. Uh, it was already electric, but it sure made it interesting figuring out how to electrify the rest of their house. Kilns are, they get hot, <laughs> they're big. Uh, but mostly we're working on the big impacting devices, heat pump water heaters and, and HVAC. Okay, let's talk a little bit about why we need more electrification to make for better electrification. Electrification is fundamentally this local and temporal or time-based challenge. Everything's changing all the time. When you consider utilities and energy options and climate and incentives and rebates and contractors and the equipment availability and even more things like how inspectors behave and what's allowed in the local jurisdiction. And there are so many things changing that the only way to handle all of this change, all of this variability, is to do it big with lots of technology and data. So at our core, we're actually a software and technology and data company. But for the folks interacting with us, it sure seems like we're just helpful, friendly people that are coaching them along on their journey. The only way we can do all of that helpful coaching is by being a technology company under the under the hood. And part of why we need to do that is because the more we see and the more we interact with, the better we get at helping everybody else electrify. Uh, you've probably seen a lot how companies, as they have more access to more information, can produce better results. And in our case, the results we seek is faster, better, cheaper home electrification. This is a little bit about me. We heard a little in the intro um, and I'm joined uh, by a bunch of great folks. Our team is nearly 10 people, uh, including Adam, uh, who leads operation and policy. He's got over 20 years of progressive political and advocacy organizational experience, including Credo Mobile and more recently Move On. We think of a lot of what we do around in through the lens of um, progressive policy and advocacy, uh, because we need folks to be out there uh, talking to each other, making advocating for change and actually making change occur. Uh, and that's what we're talking about a bit today. OK, let's get on to some of the reasons why we're talking about electrification as powerful climate action uh, and why you as engaged climate 
advocates, activists have a terrific opportunity to accelerate progress. First of all, let's be clear about this. If you own a home, you own its appliances, right? Like the machines in your home are going to need replacement. These are non-optional purchases. Today, across America, sadly, <laughs> people spend over $60 billion a year buying new gas appliances to replace old gas appliances, or more strictly, more new fossil fuel appliances in the East, there's oil appliances as well. What's happening coming up over the coming years is that spend is going to shift, and we want that shift to happen sooner. This isn't new optional spending. This is mandatory spending, whether it's because your machine gets old or you're sick of it uh, harming your kid's health or you don't want the high gas bills anymore. The shift in spending is going to happen. And our challenge is to accelerate it. So really, I'm talking about shifting the framing about think how you think about home electrification and how you talk about it. It's not a if, it's a when. Now, some parts of electrification are optional. Solar, batteries, and somewhat insulation, they're optional. The grid's gonna be around forever. You don't have to get solar. It's a good idea, especially once you electrify. But heat pump water heaters, heat pumps for space heating and cooling, induction stoves, these are not optional. When your old machine breaks, you need a new one. And let's, uh, or hopefully sooner than that, when your old machine is harming your neighborhood and your family and your climate, you need a new one. Uh, let's make sure it's an electric one. Uh, and, um, you know, upcoming bans on fossil gas appliances are going to cause us to be mandatory. Um, I mentioned my involvement with implementing the Bay Area ban. Uh, the only way we're gonna to get to actually put that in place on time is if a lot of electrification precedes it. No way is the Bay Area Air Quality Management District gonna say, okay, let's implement this ban unless a lot of electrification is happening already and there's a clear line of sight to even more happening when it becomes required. So shifting the framing here is one of the most powerful things you could do as climate communicators and advocates. This isn't an if question, should you or shouldn't you? This is a when question, when will you? Additionally, this isn't a, it costs money, it's a, it saves money. Electrification is really changing in most places and for most people from something that costs extra to something that costs less. That's kind of a secret that not a lot of folks know, but now that you know, you can help change the framing out there. And finally, the question of what about, well, what about uh, recycling my plastic straws? I know, kind of ridiculous example. Look, electrifying your home is the single most important climate action you can take. It is incredibly impactful. So when you hear this what about question, that's fine if that's the thing that kind of has your imagination right now. But did you know that the single most powerful thing you can do is take action to decarbonize? Uh, I think it helps to shift the framing. So that single most impactful choice, uh, it really is the number one way we can take action. Uh, our homes are at the center of our lives. So let's start here. And there's plenty of homes with resources and motivation to get the ball rolling, paving the way for everybody else. When you electrify sooner, you help those who follow in your footsteps. We already know what to do. It's already becoming cheaper. There is no need to wait for any new technology, new development, new thing. It's all here today. And to help more folks do it later, we need more folks doing it sooner. Now, in most households, water and space heating are the single largest climate impact often by far, the carbon pollution from a typical home is equivalent to something like 10,000 miles of driving. And a lot of us are driving a lot less than 10,000 miles a year, especially 10,000 miles a year in gas powered cars. Also electrification is a one-time choice, right? You choose once to change your gas heater to a heat pump which then reduces many, many tons of CO2 equivalent going into the future. Compare that with choices you have to make again and again, like, am I gonna order off the vegetarian menu? Also an important choice, 
but one that can be a little more difficult cognitively because you have to keep choosing it. This you just do once. And the heat pump water heater is probably the single most impactful climate appliance because its impact per dollar spent is just off the charts. We are now occasionally finding opportunities for folks to get heat pump water heaters for free. The rebates are that big, the deals are that good, uh, and the uh, carbon reductions are so massive. Now, induction stoves are also really impactful, especially for occupant health and also for the cooking experience. Cooking on induction is amazing, <laughs> way better than gas. And HVAC, heat pumps for heating and cooling, are probably the most impactful for home comfort. You know, frankly, when you have a heat pump water heater, your shower is still hot. But when you have a heat pump for heating and cooling your home, it's often more comfortable than when you were heating it with a gas furnace. I see a question about um, uh, the source of energy for electrification and do we need a clean grid? Amazingly, uh, the scientists have done the math. And even if all of your electricity came from coal, the single worst climate impact type of electricity, we still would be better off if you electrified your home. I know this is a hard one to get, and this is one of the places where you as a climate communicator can really find a challenge in thinking uh, this through, but the science is clear on it. Um, and luckily here in Northern California, and frankly, most of the Western US, um, many places in the Western US, our electricity grid is far cleaner than 100% coal. Uh, so absolutely, we do not need to wait for the grid to be any cleaner. Uh, it frankly doesn't matter how dirty it is, electrifying is still a climate choice. I also see a question about uh, what if you're a renter? So the renter situation is admittedly challenging. There are some limited things you can do by yourself, like use an induction cooktop that you plug into the wall instead of your gas stove. Quick Carbon has started working in a limited circumstances with renters and landlords to figure out ways to electrify uh, the properties. And there are some really great uh, technical assistance and rebate programs to help multifamily building owners. Um, but really, the owner of the building uh, is the one uh, who t needs to be involved in the decision to electrify it. Uh, and it is uh, challenging uh, at times. Um, Let's keep going. Just a quick look at where we see fossil gas usage in, in uh, California homes. Typically about half goes to water heating, a little over a third goes to space heating, and the rest is the other tiny slice there. It surprises people how little their stove and their dryer use. Um, mostly people think they use a lot more than they do or produce a lot more climate impact because they're interacting with them all the time. Whereas their water heater just sits in a closet, like harming the climate, <laughs> uh, but not in an obvious way though. So, uh, Ron is asking about why an induction stove versus a traditional electric stove. So many great reasons. Induction stoves heat up and cool down much faster. They're much more responsive. They're more efficient and turning electricity into heat. Uh, they also stay cool. So when you are, are using them and turn them off, you don't have an issue with getting burned. That coolness also reduces the heat inside your home. So you have less energy use and less uncomfortable kitchens because your stove is heating up your kitchen. Uh, and uh, they're pretty much about the same uh, price uh, as electric stoves. Uh, and almost the same price as gas stoves. After rebates, they're typically cheaper. All right, why now? So early electrification is climate activism of the finest sort. Timing really matters, and now is much better than later for a few reasons. First, it develops the market. When you're electrifying today, you are pulling demand from original equipment manufacturers, sorry, jargon, the people that make the machines. You're pulling demand from the people that warehouse the machines and sell them. And you're pulling the demand from contractors who are seeing, oh, people are buying electrific uh, electrification projects. I guess this is a thing. Maybe I should do more of it. Maybe I should get more involved in it. Everybody along that chain is hearing, I guess this is a thing as we buy more electrification. Also, it reduces consumption of gas, which thus hastens the demise of the gas network. 
One of the impacts of having gas appliances is everything that happens upstream of your home. All of that fracking and drilling for gas, all of the transportation of gas, there are climate impacts from methane leaks, there are environmental impacts from fracking. The less gas we consume, the less of all of that there is. Uh, and we start consuming less gas by electrifying. Now, it also expands the realm of the possible for advocates and policymakers and politicians. I mentioned the BACMUD uh, proceeding to ban gas appliances. It's not going to happen if nobody's electrifying. If lots of people are electrifying, it's way more likely. And that sort of decision making where policymakers and advocates and politicians are looking at what the market is doing to inform what they're going to say the market should do in the future. That happens all the time, especially in this space where the forces of evil are pushing against us. And indeed, there are forces, <laughs> folks that make and sell gas uh, don't want this to happen. Uh, and we need to vote with our wallets. Finally, early electrification adopters are really powerful voices for more electrification, especially if they do it right. We want people out there telling stories to one another. I did it. It was great. It's working out so well for me. Those sorts of stories are the key thing that's going to move electrification ever faster, but it doesn't happen unless people start. All right, let me glance at a few quick questions here. Um, uh, ovens, uh, uh, induction stoves have electric ovens. Uh, so it, uh, uh, it, when you move to an induction stove, you get an electric oven. Um, I'm asked if electrification makes energy bills cheaper. Uh, it certainly does over time. Uh, in the immediate, like next month, the difference is probably small. Uh, but over time, the difference will get large and cheaper. No. Now, another reason. Electrified homes are more valuable. Uh, I've got a link to some research on this in the Quick Carbon FAQ. Yes, these slides will be available. I'll post a link to them at the end of the presentation. Not only are electrified homes more valuable, but also if you ever sell your home, the buyer is going to feel like, ah, this home is future proofed. I don't have a legacy archaic device in the home. I have the thing that I'm going to have to have in the future. Right. When gas appliance bans come into effect, the very next time an electric an, a gas appliance fails, it's going to need to be electrified. If you've taken care of that, the buyer of the home is going to perceive more value there in a way that we're already seeing in scientific studies of real estate. Now, shift the framing. Right. The old fashioned way of thinking about this is that we have to pay to fight climate change. We have to sacrifice to fight climate change. We've got to put on a cardigan to fight climate change. No more. Now we get paid to fight climate change. Electrified homes are more valuable. They're typically cheaper to own and operate. They're better in a way that isn't at all about putting on a cardigan. It's about, it's a hot day, go ahead, turn down the AC. It's you want to um, uh, take a longer shower. It's fine. Well, except the drought, but no drought uh, this year, I guess you want to take a longer shower. That's fine. You're not uh, harming the climate by heating up all that water. It's really a new reality. Again, we're shifting this framing from one of sacrifice and sort of premium to one where you're getting paid to get more at the same time that you save the planet is incredibly powerful. So there's no green premium up front. Typically, electrification projects can be the same or cheaper than equivalent gas, gas projects. It's important to do the math right. Many folks don't, and certainly most contractors don't do the math right. So having an advisor, someone to help you make sure that the math is being done right is helpful. And we're really looking here at the total cost of ownership, where we're thinking about the bill impacts going into the future. You know, when you buy a machine, you're also buying the responsibility of fueling it with whether it's gas or electricity uh, for many years to come. So thinking about the future cost of that fuel is important. This is especially true of heat pump water heaters I mentioned before. We're sometimes now seeing that they are free or nearly free uh, and also especially true while rebates are large and rebates are pretty darn large right now. Now, uh, there's also no go green premium ongoing. Electrified homes are typically cheaper to operate, especially in the long term, uh, and you get to benefit from those longer term uh, changes sooner if you electrify sooner. Also, electricity gets cheaper when people buy more of it. I used to work at PG&E and uh, understand a little bit about how electricity is priced. 
but it's kind of priced on the basis of uh, how many um, units of usage the cost of the network is divided across. Uh, and if we, um, as we consume more electricity, it's going to become cheaper for everybody relatively. And of course, on the flip side, as we consume less gas, it's going to increase the cost of gas, which is going to motivate more electrification. Also, solar is a good complement. I mean, you could get solar now or later. Um, it's great. Uh, it works. It helps. Uh, note that solar is not a powerful climate response. Our electricity supply is already pretty clean. Adding solar to your house does very little to change the climate impact of your home or of your lifestyle, um, but it can change the economics in a powerful way. Um, let's get rid of another myth here. Um, harmful appliances should not be kept around. Uh, if you have a faulty, I don't know, um, lawnmower uh, that's missing the blade guard, you don't keep using it because it hasn't worn out yet, right? You get rid of it because it's dangerous. Gas appliances are dangerous for your community and your climate. Uh, and replacing them is always better. Now, um, I've seen the math and I've repeated it myself. The climate impact of early retirement is also positive. Yes, it causes a little bit of climate impact to make a new machine. You've got to make the steel, recycle the steel and make the machine in a factory and probably bring it to your house in a truck. True. Those climate impacts get accelerated if you replace your gas appliance with an electric one sooner than you might otherwise. But the benefit to the climate starts accruing within months. The extra impact you cause by having a machine sooner gets more than offset by the carbon reductions that occur by not burning gas, typically within six months or less. So please don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, I should wait until I've used up my appliance. That just causes more damage and delays the benefit beneficial effects of electrification for everybody, including your neighbors and others in your community. Now, rebates and incentives. We might be somewhere around like peak rebates and incentives. Uh, we've already seen some examples of rebates going up and other rebates going down. I stay in close contact with people that run rebate and incentive programs and you know, <laughs> they see what happens with other programs and they see their dwindling rebate budget dollars um, and they will sometimes make these changes so that uh, total rebates and incentives maybe stay roughly similar over time. Um, occasionally, though, there's like really rich incentives and rebates that stack up in unusually beneficial ways. But these opportunities tend to be rather fleeting, both in time uh, and also where they occur. Uh, so having somebody watch out for you really on your side uh, is critical for you to be able to take advantage of these. Now, all of the rebates, tax credits, incentives are complicated and dynamic. I'm going to suggest to you that you don't try to learn or teach all the specifics. Mostly it just makes people's heads explode and causes a, um, a, a slowing effect on their um, progress towards electrifying because it's so complicated that they think, oh, I can't deal with this. I don't really get it. Look, nobody's going to do a thing if they're thinking, I don't really get it. So instead, shift the framing to something like there's free money available right now, and you can get the most money by working with an expert. And not a lot of contractors know how to get the most money. And also, what you thought you knew about rebates and incentives, and frankly, what you thought you knew about electrification in general, it's probably changed because this world is very dynamic and moving very quickly. Now, let's keep going with some other reasons to electrify. It's terrific for family and community health, uh, especially gas stoves cause real impacts inside homes, especially when there's children around. There's some preliminary research around the impact of gas stoves in, on cognitive decline of older people as well. Um, gas appliances overall are producing a lot more lung damaging NOx, uh, nitrous oxide pollutants than our power plants. We've already done a great job of cleaning up our power plants in this state, uh, but we haven't done a great job of cleaning up our homes. We've also done a great job of cleaning up uh, our cars uh, because of emission controls and the move towards electrified transportation. Uh, now our homes are causing more NOx pollution than our cars. 
think about that. You see cars, they've got tailpipes, you see the pollution. You probably don't think, wow, actually our homes are more damaging when it comes to NOx than our cars. Now, we think you need a plan and a coach. Electrifying without that is nearly certain to result in suboptimal results, which damages word of mouth and slows subsequent adoption, right? We need people to have great experiences consistently so that they tell their friends and neighbors and we get more electrification. Without the right sort of guidance, you're probably going to end up with larger systems and larger amperage consumption, more need for service, electrical service and panel upgrades, less likely that you take optimal advantage of all the rebates, especially considering how rebates um, uh, sort of interact over time. Some rebates you can, are limited annually. So figuring out what's the right order of operations. And also the equipment that gets installed is less likely to be commissioned, that is installed and operated in an optimal fashion. There are way more knobs and dials, uh, but mostly sort of uh, virtual ones on electric appliances than there are on the gas appliances that preceded them. Uh, and getting all those settings correct can be tricky. If you just have a plan, uh, that is maybe not quite enough either because the world's changing pretty fast, uh, especially the rebates and incentives and keeping the plan updated is really important to stay optimized. So I'm now gonna get into some quick questions here and I'll turn my attention also to uh, the questions in the chat, but where do you start? I, mean, I think you start with a plan and a coach uh, and also with a purchase buy something, <laughs> use your wallet. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it might actually end up being free. So don't use your wallet, but do take the action to buy something, some sort of electrification retrofit. Get the flywheel going that produces that pull through the market that causes more electrification to happen around you and supports even more electrification in the future. Look, I'm here to encourage you to take action, right? I'd love you to join Quick Carbon. It's free, it takes a few minutes. I'd love you to help your friends join Quick Carbon, maybe do it with them or for them. Really what I'm hoping you do is shifting the frame, right? This isn't a question of if, it's a question of when. This isn't a question of how can I afford it? It's a question of how can I not afford it? Don't you wanna get paid while you're helping the planet? Keeping your eyes on the prize is so vital here and electrifying their home for most folks is the single most important thing that anyone can do for the future of our planet. So I hope that you'll choose to take action. Now, um, I welcome, wow, well, there's an extra O in there. I got very excited. I welcome your suggestions, your feedback, your experiences. Um, this is the first time I've given this presentation, but I do hope to bring a version of this to other climate groups uh, in other places in the future. So please help me help other climate advocates by telling me afterwards, what did I miss? Uh, what did you like? Um, how can I make this better in terms of motivating uh, a change in thinking and motivating action. All right, uh, let's do some questions. Do I need a service upgrade or a panel upgrade for my electrical? You probably don't need a service upgrade. Um, some people still want one. There is a sort of false narrative out there that everybody needs one. Um, not true. Most homes can be fully electrified with no service upgrade. Service is the amount of power you get from the power pole or from the underground conduit. Typically, it's 100 amps, 125 amps, maybe 200 amps. For most homes, that's enough. You don't need any more, uh, but not uh, everybody will tell you that. <laughs> You also probably don't need a panel upgrade, but you'll likely get what's called a sub panel, a little cute mini panel next to your big panel because we need more space for circuit breakers. Uh, and when you work with a plan and a coach and an electrification, electrification friendly electrician, they're gonna work this all out for you uh, in an optimal way. Also got a question beforehand about insulation and air sealing and can, can it make a significant difference in the size or the efficiency or the cost of the system? Look, insulation and air sealing in our climate uh, here in Northern California, it's really good for comfort. Like it can make your home feel more comfortable and it's pretty good for operating costs. But the impact on the upfront cost of the heat pump is modest. Most of the cost of heat pumps is in labor. And whether you have a big heat pump or a small heat pump, that labor is still the same sort of cost. It rarely makes financial sense. So don't try to use a financial analysis to decide whether or not you should get insulation. Use a comfort analysis, you know? Like, do you have an uncomfortable room? Do you want your house to be less drafty? Uh, and of course, check with your coach.
Um, I see a message here from Willie uh, asking about uh, Quick Carbon's uh, charging. Um, we Our service is free. Uh, Quick Carbon is free to homeowners. Um, I got asked about various brands of heat pumps um, and whether the proposed sizing is correct. Um, oh, I realized there I only answered the first question. There's really not huge differences between brands. But when it comes to HVAC heat pumps, you definitely want a variable capacity heat pump. Please only buy those variable capacity. Single or dual speed heat pumps are not a good choice. The variable capacity ones are only slightly more expensive and produce much more efficient operation and much more comfortable homes. Um, um, how are you gonna get your gas meter removed? Call your utility, it's free. Um, do you need special cookware for an induction cooktop? Probably not. You probably already have it. Grab a fridge magnet and see if it sticks to the bottom of uh, the pan. And if it does, your pan is good to go. Just use the fridge magnet to find out. I got asked how noisy are heat pumps. Um, for a heat pump water heater, uh, they can make enough sound, depending on the layout of your house, that you want to be thoughtful about where it goes. It might not go in the same place that your gas water heater is. For heat pumps um, that are uh, for space heating and cooling, the exterior unit can make sound and you wanna be thoughtful about where you put it considering the sound impact inside your home, like maybe don't put it right outside your bedroom window, but the interior units of a heat of HVAC heat pumps, they're not noisy enough to be concerned with. Um, um. I sometimes get asked about tankless water heaters. Um, yeah, tankless water heaters are terrible. <laughs> they still burn gas, but even worse, they release methane, which is a hugely impactful uh, climate uh, climate impacting gas. Um, heat pump water heaters don't burn gas. Like this, you don't need a slightly more efficient gas appliance. Um, just like you don't need a slightly less dangerous lawnmower, right? You need to get rid of that thing. Hi, um, I have a question for Cooper. I'm wondering, um, I, it sounds like contractors uh, pay you to uh, belong. And um, I'm wondering uh, if and or and or how you may vet them. Um, and uh, do you also train them? Um, just wondering about that. Sure. Um the answer to how we vet them, probably the best place is on our FAQ, which I'll put here in the chat. Just a second. There we go. Um, and um, do we train them? Um, yeah, in a way, uh, <laughs> we help them get better at electrification uh, sort of service uh, to customers because it's a collaboration, right? Um a plumber doesn't know how to optimize your electrical panel, nor are they staying in touch with all the rebates that haven't even come onto the market yet. But we are, on the other hand, we're not plumbers and we don't really know how to turn the wrenches to put in the heat pump water heater. We help them stay focused on what they do best and what we need them to do more of, which is turning wrenches in garages and basements. And we do the other stuff, whether it's optimizing the rebates and incentives, uh, helping homeowners feel comfortable with making these choices, uh, figuring out how to minimize the electrical impacts, and so on. Uh, and it's a great partnership. Uh, and frankly, it's part of why contractors um, work with us uh, is because we're not just bringing them uh, clients, we're bringing them expertise and real collaboration. Before the presentation, I got asked, like, what's the most efficient way to operate my heat pump HVAC system? Mm. And more or less, the answer is, like, set it and forget it. Um, unlike your furnace, where you may be constantly turning it on and off, heat pumps tend to work better if you just program them, set a temperature at the day and maybe a different temperature at night. Uh, perhaps consider your electricity rate plan uh, and maybe program it to use less electricity when electricity is expensive. Um, but more or less, you set them and forget them. That's how they work best. I have a specific question, which is like how it works. Like I join community at Quick Carbon or whatever. And then is there some kind of intake process? Do you yes. come to the house? Blah, blah, blah. No. There's kind of assessment yeah. inventory. And then there's essentially a design process and an advice process. Is that how it works? Or? That's exactly right. Yeah. We don't typically come to your house. So come to the website, come to quickcarbon.com. 
Um, and uh, you can join right there in just a few minutes. Um, we're going to ask you a few questions about your house. We're going to ask you for a few photos of your appliances. We're going to um, you're going to grant us access to your utility data um, just by saying OK. Uh, and um, we're going to have a, a call with you, a video call. You'll speak with one of my colleagues who will answer, uh, ask you a few more questions, answer your questions. And that's enough for us to put together your initial roadmap for your home uh, and get us started on the process of then continually optimizing it as things change and being responsive to your needs in terms of you deciding, okay, now I want to go forward with something or I want to wait till next year or whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, that's more or less it. Sounds great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I, great presentation. Thank you. I think I understood everything. I was a little confused when you said so putting on solar panels doesn't really have a significant, was it environmental impact? Yes, that's right. wasn't quite clear about that. Yeah, so what's going on is that so much solar has been deployed in California that during the day, most of the time, all of the electricity that we're using in the state is coming from solar or wind or maybe hydropower or nuclear. They're all zero carbon sources, right? Think what you think about nuclear, whatever. Uh, we don't need to get into that. I like do know that it doesn't produce carbon, right? So. Um, our electricity during the sunny hours is carbon free for the most part. When you put solar panels on your house, you just make more carbon free electricity. But we already have more or less enough. Now, when a lot of people electrify, if nobody else put out more solar and there was no more solar built, sure, but that's not going to happen. Um, it just, my point was don't mistake solar for climate action. Solar is more of an economic choice now. Like you can save some money on your bills, especially if your home is electrified. Like if you've already shifted your fuel consumption from gas to electricity, you could save some money by getting solar, but it's really not gonna make much of a difference to your climate impact. Not anymore, not in California. There's other parts of the country where that's not at all the case, right? Where it makes a huge impact, but it just doesn't make much of a difference here. And so with your limited dollars and time and attention, we really hope you'll focus on reducing your combustion of fossil fuels by electrifying your space heating and water heating. Right, thank you, excellent answer. Thank you for that clarification, uh, John. Hi, um, great presentation, Cooper. Thank you very much. Um, sure. Important work you're doing. Um, I want to, this is a perfect segue to kind of follow up on what, about the issue about solar. Um, what I didn't hear you discuss, and ha because it hasn't really been available yet, is bidirectional EV charging. Mm, and yeah, know, there are some new systems coming online whereby you can use your solar to directly charge your EV and then use your EV to power your home at peak time. And that really will help reduce carbon on the grid, I think, overall. But it's, it's then you're kind of you're shifting your electricity, you know, intake and usage, right? So it's, it's a... Absolutely. It's a, yeah. We're a huge fan. Um, we advocate for them in almost all homes that we work with. We often counsel against dedicated home batteries. We mm -hmm. find that the economics don't work uh, and uh, that there's other reasons to not get home batteries beyond economics. Um, bi-directional electric vehicles with bi-directional chargers are absolutely, we believe, superior in almost all cases. There's one big problem, though, which is they're not really available. <laughs> but that's okay, right? This is a journey for everybody we work with. Uh, we don't, we've never had a client that said, I'm doing it all at once. Let's electrify and be done. Yeah. It, people just don't behave that way. They behave incrementally, which is fine. That's how everybody's behaved for decades. Mm -hmm. um, so instead, in the roadmaps we develop and the advice we give, we counsel people, hey, why don't you plan on having your next car be a bi-directional EV? Some people already have them. Many cars on the market are already bi-directional capable. And eventually, when they become available, get a bi-directional charger. And now your car is your home battery, a mm -hmm. much larger, much cheaper home battery than you would buy if you bought a dedicated one. Um, so yeah, we're a huge fan. Um, yeah. I've been watching Decibel's development closely. I actually have been on some calls with them recently, uh, making okay. sure that our clientele are among the first to get access to them. Yeah, Perfect. it's great, yeah. but it's yeah. going to take a while. I mean, it could easily be another year or more before we really have them readily available. 
Yeah, we're certified now. I work for Decibel, actually. So we're oh, certified. Yeah, we're North American certified, so we're ready to start sipping. Um, but it will take a while to get them out in, in mass, you know, no question. Yes. Yeah. Super. Can you explain for those who are not, who have not heard about bidirectional EVs, what they are, please? Sure. The idea is that your car has a giant battery in it. Uh, depending on the car, it's equivalent to something like four to 10 Tesla power walls. So it's a huge amount of power. And when your car is bidirectional and it's connected to a bidirectional charger, electricity can flow out of your car's battery into your home. Bidirectional. So normally we think of electricity going from our home into our electric car to charge the battery. Well, it can also go the other direction. Why would you want that? Well, maybe during peak electricity demand, when it's more expensive, you could use electricity from your car instead of from the grid. Maybe during peak carbon electricity, when they're running lots of fossil gas peaker plants, you could use your car's electricity. How about during a, a, a blackout? You can use your car to power at least a portion of your home. Uh, these are the sorts of reasons why you'd want to um, uh, have your car be bidirectional and feed power back into your home. And I'll point out a common misperception, either it's not allowed or it's hugely damaging for the car. No, when you buy a car that is bidirectional capable, the warranty on the car is just as long as the non-bidirectional cars. Manufacturers know exactly what they're doing. They're saying it works. It's good. You're good to go. Uh, and using your car as a home battery is much less um, effort for your car than driving it. <laughs> driving an electric vehicle causes your battery to discharge very quickly. Using it for your home battery, it's like it laughs. Like that's easy. Uh, it causes no impact on the lifespan of your car. Thank you so much for this presentation. It's fantastic. And I uh, especially appreciate you giving the uh, slide deck, uh, making that available for us in the future. My question is, do you have any idea when the California guidelines for the implementation of the IRA will be released in terms of the tax rebates, the incentives, the tax uh, credits, rather, and rebates and incentives that um, the IRA uh, was written to yeah. include? Yeah. Um, so some of them are already in effect. The tax credits are already in effect. Uh, the rebates and incentives, um, my understanding, and I just got this update today on one of the uh, calls that I'm regularly on, is that the state is prioritizing implementation for low, moderate income households first, as well they should. Uh, so um, it sounds like it could be a while for market rate households uh, like I don't know. I got the impression it could easily be a year. Um, on the other hand, apparently the technique they're trying to use is to sort of bring some of that money to the market in the context of existing programs. So they don't have to stand up new programs and new bureaucracies around them. Um, frankly, it's one of the things we, we analyze when we look at each home and each person's situation and try to provide advice on well, you could do it now, you could do it later, maybe the economics are gonna end up being pretty similar, but of course, climate impact and market development impact is better if you do it sooner. Um, but yeah, good question. Nobody really, really knows <laughs> the timing on when the things that haven't hit the market yet are going to hit the market, uh, the IRA um, uh, point of purchase rebates. Thank you so much, we appreciate it and um, good night. Thanks, everybody, and happy birthday, Inflation yeah, Reduction Act. Happy birthday.